Hello friends, in last video I have discussed from where the lithium was extracted, which are the extraction processes, which countries produces lithium, also where in India lithium could be produced, what are the adverse effects of lithium extraction. So if you haven't watched that episode 1 of lithium manufacturing from start to end, then I suggest you click on the i button and watch that video first. Now, we are going to look at different overall cell form factors to give a better understanding of how a cell is manufactured. And therefore, the electrodes are packaged inside the cell. A lithium ion has three parts. First is negative electrode, second is positive electrode, and third is electrolyte and separators. So in this video, I am going to tell you about the negative electrolyte. So let's start the video. There are three basic form factors that are used for lithium ion battery cells. The photograph shows several examples of cylindrical format cells. There is not much to say about why they are named as cylindrical cells, but they are packaged inside a cylinder. Besides cylindrical cells, there are several examples of what are known as prismatic format lithium ion battery cells. Again, these cells have that name because they are packaged in metal rectangular prisms. And the third one are the pouch cells. These type of cells may look quite similar to that of prismatic type of cell, but we are going to see that they are packaged quite differently internally. And while the cylindrical and prismatic cells are usually packaged in thin aluminum cases, the pouch cells are packaged in a thin material that looks more like a thin plastic bag. It's actually a little stronger than that, than the plastic bag. But that's what it appears to the eye. And since this bag or pouch contains the internal component of the cell, that's why we call it a pouch cell. Even though the external form factor of different lithium ion batteries can be quite different, it turns out that the electrode that make up the active parts of these cells are manufactured by very similar processes regardless of how the cell is packaged. The particles that compromise the electrodes are coated onto both sides of metallic foils that act as current collectors and these current collectors then conduct the electronic current into and out of the cell. The diagram illustrates the top part of positive electrode with active materials coating both sides of an aluminum foil current collector and in the bottom part we see the negative electrode active materials coating both sides of a copper foil current collector. By now I think you realize that the purple color is used in this illustration is to indicate the positive electrode active material and the green color is used to illustrate the negative electrode active material. And this is simply for the illustration purpose only. In actual electrodes, the materials are usually gray or almost black in color and they are hard to tell apart by eye. So even though the electrodes themselves for different form factors of lithium ion batteries are made in similar ways with similar processes, the way that they are actually assembled into the battery cells differs depending on whether we are constructing a prismatic or a cylindrical or a pouch cell. So inside a pouch cell, the electrodes turn out to be stacked on top of each other. Whereas inside of a cylindrical or a prismatic cell, they are wound in some kind of a spiral. Pouch cells are increasingly being used in battery applications because they minimize the amount of space wasted by packaging. This image illustrates the structure internal to a pouch cell. So to build a pouch cell, you take a positive electrode and then you put up a layer of separator material on top and then put an electrode and a layer of separator and you repeat that until you have stacked up enough of these electrode structures to have a total capacity that you desire in your cell. The separator may be cut to essentially the same size 
and shape as the electrodes probably a little bit larger to make sure that there is no opportunity for shifting of the separator and causing a short circuit between the plates or it may be cut in zigzag between the electrodes for maybe even a more robust design the electrode themselves are stamped or cut into this individual plate shapes out of a longer roll of electrode material and they are stamped to all have exactly the same size to fit on top of each other neatly the current collectors and the electrodes have little tabs as you can see in the figure and they are designed so that all the tabs of the negative electrode of current collectors come out at the same place and all of the tabs of the positive electrode of current collectors come out at the same place as each other but different place from where the negative electrode tabs come out here you can see that the tabs are drawn as all coming out of the right side of the cell some of the newer design that are being manufactured have all the tabs the negative electrode tabs coming out of one side and all the positive electrode tabs coming out of the other side so there are some advantages to the newer design in that you can have a more uniform usage of these cells and more uniform temperature distribution in the cell but there are also some manufacturing challenges because it turns out to be somewhat difficult to reliably seal the pouch where those tabs exit the cell so inside of this pouch packaging you see that there are really many negative electrodes and many positive electrodes all of the negative electrodes are welded together as their tabs and are further more welded to the negative terminal of the battery cell and all the positive electrodes are welded together and further more welded to the positive terminal of the battery cell as well cylindrical and prismatic cells are built quite differently in these cells there is a long negative electrode and a single positive electrode and these electrodes are cut into long strips of material and then a separator is placed in between them and then we take this sandwich of positive electrodes separator negative electrodes and separator and we wind it in a spiral around a mandrel so in the cylindrical cell we wind it around a very thin rod or a cylindrical mandrel if the central mandrel is not a rod or a cylinder but is a rectangular plate we end up with a prismatic cell which is present in your phone the only difference is that it's a squash cylinder that's longer and thinner historically cylindrical cells have been very popular because they are the easiest to manufacture and they are still the cell of choice in tesla automobiles but when you try to pack cylindrical cells together to make a battery pack there is quite many space wasted between the cylinder you yourself tried by building a battery pack and you will see that there's a lot of vacant space between the cylinders now if you use this space uh, for an advantage like if we design our battery pack in such a way that the space provides a pathway for coolant such as forced air or forced liquid but often there is more space left between the cells than is actually needed to cool the battery pack so prismatic cells are little bit better in that respect there is not really necessary any space between the metal cases when we pack them together kind of like a lego in a battery pack in fact sometimes we find that we have to add a little bit of space between the cells in order to leave a pathway for coolant flow between them so even though it's look like there's no wasted space in prismatic cells battery pack actually there is because if you try to open up the prismatic package and look at the jelly roll inside it you would find that at the four corners where the jelly roll is rounded but the case is rectangular there is a little bit of wasted space this amount of space is not as much in a cylindrical cell design because the prisms can be quite a bit larger but there is still some space that is not occupied essentially all of this space in a pouch cell design is used by the necessary cell components and this pouches can be packed together for a very compact overall battery pack again we need to make sure that 
or design has room for coolant to flow. So sometimes we have spacers between the pouch cells. But overall, we can pack the pouch cells a little bit more densely than the prismatic and the prismatic a little bit more densely than the cylindrical. So now I am going to turn my attention to the actual materials that are used in a typical lithium ion battery pack. And we start by looking at the materials used for the particles that form the negative electrode. At this point in history, essentially all commercial lithium ion battery cells use some form of graphite for their negative electrodes. Graphite is very common. In fact, graphite is the material that is used inside of your pencils. Graphite is one form of carbon and it is formed by layer of graphene stacked together. So the picture here tries to illustrate stacked graphene. If you look at the microstructure of graphite at the atomic scales level, the molecular level, the gray mesh depicts layers of the graphene and the graphene is internally compromised of repeating patterns of rings of six carbon atoms in a hexagonal shape. So overall, it forms a kind of honeycomb structure. Graphene is extremely strong and these honeycomb structures are very difficult to break apart. However, the bonding between one layer of graphene and its neighboring layer is quite weak and this is why graphene is used in pencils. When you write with a pencil, it's this layer of graphene that flake off and stay on the paper. So the graphene does not get broken. It's in between the layers of graphene that the graphite fractures and leaves some graphene on your page. And it's also this weak bonding between the layers that makes the graphite useful for an electrode material. So in the diagram, the purple sphere which you see that illustrates lithium atom and these lithium atoms can intercalate in between these layers of graphene. So in graphite, there's room for one lithium atom per six carbon atoms in this honeycomb structure. Let me tell you an interesting fact. When the negative electrode is constructed, there is no lithium in it. All of the lithium is in the positive electrode. So when we charge the battery cell for the first time, then the lithium from positive electrode moves to the negative electrode through electrolyte and enters into this graphite and lithiates the graphite. You saw the microscopic or even nanoscale view of lithium and graphite. Now we will look at somewhat larger scale. In larger scale, we find that the layers of graphene are not uniform large planes that spans the entire electrode or even an entire particle. So instead, there are smaller regions where the graphene that forms the graphite occur with parallel plates. And then there's other neighboring regions where these parallel plates are aligned in a slightly different orientation. So we call the individual region where the graphene has aligned the grain of a particle and the boundaries between different alignments the grain boundaries. So if you look at a particle overall, the grain boundaries may be fairly well aligned or they may be completely random. In natural graphite or human made graphite, which is called as synthetic graphite, the grain boundaries are fairly close to parallel throughout the entire structure. But in some forms of carbon that are usually known as hard carbon or coke, the grain boundaries are quite randomly oriented and both of these are illustrated in the diagram that you see here. So lithium enters into the regions of layer between the graphite, but it does in slightly different ways depending on whether the electrode is made from natural or synthetic graphite or whether it is made instead from a hard carbon. So as a result, there are somewhat different voltage properties and lifetime properties for cell built from these materials. Oftenly, the manufacturers will use some proprietary blend 
of graphite and hard carbons in their negative electrode. Graphite is used in probably every commercial lithium ion cell in the market. But there are other materials that could be used as well. And one another material that has some interesting property is lithium titanate oxide or LTO. LTO has a very different crystal structure from graphite. And the figure here shows this structure at an atomistic scale. So in this figure, the titanium atoms are drawn as orange spear and the oxygen atoms are drawn as red spears. The titanium and oxygen atoms are tightly bounded into this crystalline structure so that these bonds are not disturbed when lithium enters or leaves the particle. And the tight bonding is illustrated in the diagram by showing with green planes the faces of the crystal that these bonds construct overall. Again, lithium is shown as purple spears and the purple spears are able to move through the opening in this crystal structure just like they are able to move between the graphene layers inside the graphite. But while the openings in graphite were simple wide open layers, the openings in LTO are instead convoluted three-dimensional pathway. And we will learn that some material used in positive electrodes also share some similar properties of LTO, which I will discuss in next video. So the graph here shows the open circuit potential of different negative electrode materials versus their electrode state of charge. Now the electrode state of charge is related to but different from the cell state of charge. So to be more precise, I prefer to the electrode state of charge as this stoichiometry of the electrode. If the electrode has no lithium stored in its opening, then the stoichiometry will be zero. If the electrode is full of lithium, in other words, it can't store any more lithium than its storing capacity, then the stoichiometry will be one. If the electrode is partially full and stoichiometry will be value between zero to one. And that's why it represents a kind of an electrode state of charge. Now the voltage of a battery cell overall is equal to the potential of the positive electrode current collector minus the potential of the negative electrode current collectors. To have a high voltage battery cell, we desire high potential and the positive electrode materials and low potential in the negative electrode materials will work to have a high potential battery. And looking at this graph, you can see why graphite is so attractive. The light blue or cyan colored line labeled MCMB is a form of graphite, which stands for mesocarbon microbeads. But all that we need to know is that it's a type of graphite. These beads are nearly spherical. We see that this graphite has a very low potential over its entire stoichiometry range. And that's really attractive when designing a high voltage lithium ion cell. You can also see that the hard carbon and coke, which are other forms of carbon, have slightly different voltage characteristics. From a voltage perspective, they are not quite as attractive as graphite. But from a lifetime perspective, they can have some advantages. Lithium titanate oxide has the highest potential of all those that we have seen as a candidate for a negative electrode. So from a voltage perspective, this material is not very attractive when we are designing a negative electrode. However, it turns out that battery cells that are constructed using lithium, lithium titanate oxide as their negative electrodes are nearly indestructible. These electrodes can be charged and discharged tens of thousands of times with very little noticeable capacity loss. So while the high voltage or, or high potential of the material means that the energy density of a cell using this material is quite low, the lifetime advantages can be very attractive, especially when we are out of concern about the energy density. 
Another possible negative electrode material is silicon. The possible advantage of using silicon is that it can store more lithium than carbon can. So if we use graphite as our electrode material, we can store up to one lithium atom per six carbon atoms. But if we use silicon as the electrode material instead, it turns out that we can in principle store up to four lithium atoms for every one single silicon atom. And that if you do the ratios, you find that this is roughly 24 is to 1 storage advantage using silicon instead of carbon. So in other words, the energy density if we use a silicon electrode can be a lot higher. But there is a trade-off. If we use graphite as our electrode material, the volume change when we charge and discharge the electrode is about 10% which is not very much. And that means that the stresses and strains caused by this volume change on the electrode is pretty small. But if we use silicon as our electrode material, the volume changes around is 300 or even 400 percent and that means that the stresses and the strains are enormous. And because of that, silicon electrodes tend to fracture very quickly and so they have short lives. So there is an enormous potential advantage of using silicon as the electrode material in terms of energy density and that's why still lots of research and developments are going on in silicon electrodes to design a cell. Some of the work around that research are looking at including mixing of graphite, some graphites and some silicon together inside the electrode so that the silicon does not need to form a large volume fraction of the electrode and therefore the electrode has some of the benefits of graphite and some of the benefits of the silicon material and another work around might be to use silicon nanowires that leave spaces in between these nanowires for expansion at present i am not aware of any commercial successful lithium ion battery cell that has a silicon electrode but i believe this is very likely to change the future. We know that lithium ion battery cells are manufactured in pouch, prismatic and cylinder form factors. In each of these cases, the current collector metal foils are generally coated on both sides with active materials and the negative electrode. The most common active materials at this point in history are some form of carbon. This might be natural or synthetic graphite or a hard carbon or even some mixture of these materials. In a minority of lithium ion battery cells at present, we can find lithium titanate oxide used as the negative electrode. This material greatly increases the cell longevity, but it's costly because of the relatively rarity of titanium and it also lowers the energy density of these cells. In the future, I believe it's very likely that we will see lithium ion battery cells that have some form of silicon in their negative electrodes. This will help in improving the energy density. But at the same time, the big problem is that the cycle life or the number of times the cells can be charged and discharged in low when we use the silicon electrodes. When this problem is overcome, then we are going to see a lot of silicons containing electrodes in the future. So I hope you found this video very informative and useful. Like this video and share it among your friends and let everyone know how lithium ion batteries are manufactured. Well, in the next video, I will discuss about the positive electrodes. See you then.